Good morning and welcome to today's webinar about residential letting. My name is Claire Elaine Arthurs and I'm one of the partners here at Gunner Cook and the real estate dispute resolution team. One of the areas of law that me and my team deal with is residential landlord and tenant and in particular when things have gone wrong. So the reason behind uh, us running this seminar is so that we could raise some of the areas that we are say we are seeing coming in on a near daily basis at the moment in the hope that it can save uh, some of the landlords that we work with uh, both time, effort, stress um, and also a lot of money if they can get these things right. Now the first thing to say is that this is this is very much a high level introduction of those key areas that people are getting wrong. Residential landlord and tenant has been a hot topic for the government for quite some time and as such there is new legislation coming out on a very regular basis. Um, it becomes increasingly more complex to be able to navigate it and there's no way within the scope of a half an hour webinar that I would be able to cover everything with you. So what I'm looking at today as I said is just really having a look at those high level issues that we're seeing people uh, fall over on on quite a regular basis in the hope that you can avoid those pitfalls. So what we are having a look at today is Licensing and registration of landlords, that's including these houses in multiple occupation, which are tripping quite a lot of people up. The tenant fee ban, which you may have heard about in the press. A bit of a look at um, your assured shorthold tenancy agreements and what they should be looking like. Um, considering some of the changes to do with deposits and insurance. Uh, looking at the legal requirements that you now have on commencement of your assured shorthold tenancies looking at some more landlords obligations and in particular considering the implications of section 11 of the landlord and tenant act which has obviously been around for some time but has recently been extended by the homes fitness for human habitation act 2018. so let's start with some licensing and registration now, licensing and registration is basically, uh, it was introduced as a way of local authorities keeping track of who is letting residential property in their areas. It's already compulsory in Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland. Um, obviously, this webinar is considering the law as it stands in England, but it's notable that in other parts of the UK, it's already, uh, it's, it's already been introduced throughout. In England, it looks like it is going to follow suit, but currently all we have is local authorities deciding at their own discretion as to what registration requirements they are going to have. Now, that makes life very difficult for us because the different authorities have different requirements. They have different process that you, processes that you follow to register. They have different registration fees. Um, and also some of them have been better than others at advising landlords of when they've decided to start registration. Some of them have written out to tell landlords they need to register. Others have just started issuing fines and people have found out the difficult way. And with fines for not registering being up to £50,000 and a potential for a five-year ban on letting, the consequences can be pretty dire. Other areas of the UK have been fairer. Um, Brent Smart Wales uh, is, is probably the closest scheme to what we are looking at coming in in England um, and what that involves is going on a one day course, passing a short test to say that you know the basics of being a landlord or the basics of being a letting agent, at which point you are then free to register. Um, and there's been quite a lot of publications around Wales about that. And it is helping because it's helping people not to uh, fall foul of these various new bits of legislation that are coming in around letting. But in England, for the time being, I'm afraid all we can do is keep checking with our local authorities to see who has and has not got registration in place and what their requirements are. And while you may have a letting agent in place, to uh, deal with your managing management of your letting. Licensing is very much a landlord's prerogative. 
Um, the landlord is the person who is liable and the landlord is the person who is expected to make sure they've obtained all necessary licenses and permissions before they hand the property over to most agents for them to then manage the letting directly with the individual tenant. So it's worth bearing in mind, and if you don't know whether your local authority for where your properties are has got a registration scheme, find out as soon as you possibly can. In terms of houses in multiple occupation, this is another area where a lot of people are finding difficulties at the moment. A house in multiple occupation is defined in the regulations as anywhere where you have three or more people from more than one household. That's a small HMO and there is a potential that in some areas you may have some form of registration for that. Again, what the registration requirements are in the particular requirements for an HMO's minimal um, areas for toilets, bathrooms, kitchens, etc. are varies from local authority to local authority, so you need to check the individual websites. What you do know, though, is that wherever you've got a large HMO, and that's where you've got five or more people who form more than one household, then you must register. Now, what we're talking about in terms of households, we're talking about connected parties. So obviously, um, if you've got partners or husband and wife or a family unit, they count as one household where you've got something perhaps where you've got individual rooms being let out, uh, student lets, that kind of thing. You're looking more at your HMO model. Um, there are some people that have been caught out by this when they've been letting out uh, properties, uh, letting out their own homes. Even though you might think people are coming in as lodgers. We had a lady who we were helping just a couple of weeks ago. She'd got a number of small be uh, spare bedrooms in her property, had rented four of them out, putting locks on the doors. Um, and she was living in the fifth bedroom in the property. And then she found that she'd fallen foul of not having an HMO licence. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so what you need to have a look at is, as I said, is in terms of what licensing requirements are there. Do you need to have a license in the first place? The second thing that you need to have a think about is the requirements. And the requirements may vary depending on uh, the number of occupants and the size of the property. Um, you also need to consider who is going to be managing your property. Now, HMO licensing applies to anybody who has control of the property. So it can be the freeholder, it can be a long leaseholder, it can be the agent who's managing it. Whoever is the person who is holding the HMO license needs to make sure that they are fit and proper. And by fit and proper, we mean that they haven't been banned or convicted in relation to any of the other tenancy letting requirements and legislation that we have at the moment. So there are a number of hoops to jump through in order to actually ensure that you've got the right person to hold the license in the first place. Other things you need to consider, you also should be sending the council copies of your gas safety certificate every year. You've got to make sure you've got your smoke alarms and your carbon monoxide alarms up, which I'll come on to in a minute. You do have to provide safety certificates for all electrical appliances when requested, and you do have to every five years do your electrical safety check of the full property. And the council quite possibly might impose other conditions, either generally in their area or in particular on your license. And then the license needs to be renewed every five years. So it can be quite a process to get through. In terms of getting it wrong, you can end up with a criminal conviction or a fine, uh, which is not something that you particularly want on your record. Um, it can also, uh, alternatively, if it's your first offence, you may find that the local authorities opt to make a civil fine up to around £30,000. Um, the average fine that I am certainly seeing coming across my desk at the moment is around about sixteen to 18000 uh, for first-time offences. It's also worth bearing in mind if you have a larger portfolio that if you are found that you haven't received, you haven't obtained a license for one of your properties, it is quite possible that you could find that you need to uh, that they start looking into your other properties as well. So if you've missed a number of licences, uh, then that's certainly something that needs to be dealt with with care. Um, and I would suggest that you get in touch with either myself 
or somebody else to give you some professional advice as soon as possible. The other two things that can come out of the end of not having a license for houses in multiple occupation are rent payment orders and banning orders. And it's worth just taking a bit of time to understand how these work as these are still relatively new. So rent payment orders are orders that essentially can be made for you to repay all of the rent or some of the rent that the tenant has paid to you under various different situations. And these can include unlicensed um, HMOs, the houses and multiple occupation that we've just been discussing under Section 72. Um, unlicensed property, so that's unregistered property. So either it's not been registered under a general scheme or it's not been registered under, under a local authority scheme. Um, if you use violence to secure entry, uh, illegal evictions and so on, which we'll be talking about a little bit in the next webinar. Um, failure to comply with improvement notice, that's where the significant disrepair at the property and the local authority has served a notice to do works. Failure to comply with a prohibition order, that's usually in relation to planning issues. Um, or breaches of a banning order, which brings us neatly on to having a look at what is a banning order. Now, banning orders are still relatively new. They came in on the 6th of April last year. Um, there have been some issued already, um, so they are starting to um, attract more attention. Um, and certainly this is something that we have to be aware of as landlords. So what it prevents um, is if you have a banning order made against you, then you're not allowed to rent out residential accommodation engage in any letting agency work so they can be made against residential letting agents as well or engage in any property management work and you can't be one of these people um, of, that can hold and keep an HMO license. The ban lasts for a minimum of 12 months and when you are banned you are placed on what's called the National Database of Rogue Landlords and Agents which is a national register now, bearing in mind it's a minimum of 12 months and this is local authority uh, administration, uh, the chances of your name coming off there promptly after 12 months are unlikely. And what we are generally seeing are names are going on um, and we're yet to determine how quickly those are going to be taken off because it's a pra practice of administration as to whether the local authorities will bother going back and removing them without people having to go to lengths to get them to do that. In terms of uh, moving on to the Tenant Fees Act then, this is something else that is tripping up a lot of landlords. Um, the Tenant Fees Act applies to landlords, agents and tenants and what it governs is exactly what it is that you are allowed to charge fees for to tenants going forwards. Now in principle, it used to be the case that in terms of letting out your property, a landlord would essentially be looking to move all of the costs involved with letting that property onto the tenants one way or another. And what this had led to was a practice with, in particular, managing agents, whereby a tenant was coming along, being quoted one price for the rent, and then finding that there were a large quantity of additional costs that were hidden. So there's been some introduction of transparency of how letting agents have to advertise what the fees are, but it was felt that hadn't gone far enough, so this is when the tenant fee ban came in. So what you are allowed to charge, that's your permitted payments. You are allowed to charge for rent, for a deposit. You are allowed to charge for variations to the tenancy. So say, for example, they want to add another occupier or they want permission for a pet, but that's capped at 50 pounds. £50 doesn't go very far on your administration costs. You can charge for utilities if they're included. You can charge for an early surrender premium. And you can charge for default on late payment of rent. But again, that has been capped. It's only after payment of rent is at least 14 days late. And you cannot charge more than 3% above base rate. You can also charge for replacing locks and for key fobs. But the sums that you're allowed to charge on that, again, are very low and they are generally below the cost of what a locksmith is going to charge you for doing that work. So it's worth bearing in mind that those are, those are the only things that you are now allowed to charge for and there are limits on some of them. 
In terms of what's now prohibited, this is not an exhaustive list, but it gives you an idea. You can see the full list if you go to the www.gov.uk website. But to give you an idea of what's prohibited, it's charges for viewing, for referencing, for dealing with guarantors, for inventory checks. Um, and incidentally, inventory checks, I would still suggest that you do have an in inventory or a schedule of condition where you put a client uh, tenant into the property, because if you don't, you're not protecting your own position in respect of repairs. And we're going to come on again in the next webinar to talk about repairs. So I'll pick this one up again. But bearing in mind, we can't charge for the inventory anymore. You can't charge for the right to rent checks. That's the immigration checks, which I will again come on to in a moment. You can't charge extra for pet fees, independent of the rent. Uh, you can't charge for renewal or exit fees, interest on permitted payments, professional cleaning, unless you've got that as a contractual requirement in your assured short hold tenancy agreement. You can't charge any other third party fees and you also can't charge for gardening services unless, again, those are specifically set out as a service charge. So there's quite a lot that you can't charge for there. And that is making this a bit more of a minefield because what's happening is obviously agents need to be paid. They still need to be paid for their time and their effort for doing the work. So the cost to landlords that they're being charged by their agents directly is going up. Um, and then in terms of landlords recouping their fees, they then have a balancing act because they can put the rents up. But obviously you can only put the rent up so far um, in terms of what's going to be then viable within the market. So that rent, so there, that is driving rents up. It is starting to filter through now um, and it is making life a little bit more difficult. The other thing that it's worth um, bearing in mind that has come in with that tenant fee ban is also this cap on how much you can take as a deposit. And I've stuck that up at the bottom of the slide there for you. So if your annual rent is less than £50,000, it's capped at five weeks, 50000 to £100,000 it's capped at six weeks rent. So where people were taking two or three months potentially in the past, you're now very restricted on how much deposit you are able to take. So you will notice there when I was going through, I did make some caveats about what should be included potentially on what you might think about including in your actual tenancy agreements. So you've got two main sorts of agreement when you're dealing with residential tenants that you will come across. There are some that are slightly more unusual, but they're a bit beyond the scope of this webinar. But the two that you will normally come across are assured short hold tenancies. That's everything. Uh, that's the majority of letting post 28th of February 1997. Um, and then occasionally you will come across your contractual tenancy, which is usually a tenancy to a company who are then perhaps putting one of their employees in the property. They're usually for a fixed term of six to 12 months, um, and then they're either held over or they could be periodic running from month to month or possibly sometimes quarter to quarter. Um, the reason for the agreements these days is um, it used to be the case that it protected both parties' rights. And obviously, uh, you will be aware if you've been a landlord for a while that tenants are, uh, are, are able um, since February 1997 to ask for a written statement of terms of their tenancy anyway. But actually, these days, those tenancy agreements are there to give more protection to landlords than they are to tenants. And the reason for that is that the tenants have so many rights implied by statute and legislation now that if you want to start protecting your position with regards to repairs, service charge, um, and, and so on under the terms of the actual tenancy. You want to be able to do things like rent reviews where you've got tenants that are difficult uh, to remove and they're in there for a very long time. You want to be able to uplift that rent with the market values. You need to make sure that you've got a fairly robust assured shorthold tenancy agreement in place. If you've got a managing agent, the hope is that they have got an up-to-date um, assured shorthold tenancy um, that they can use for you and that that will include in it everything uh, that's come out of recent legislation. If not, it is worth spending that bit of money to get a, an up-to-date copy from a reliable source. 
one of the things I would caution you against is any kind of free download off the internet, because um, I find this very often. There are people that have gone onto a search engine, downloaded what they think is a, a, an up-to-date AST, um, and it's either out of date, non-compliant, or sometimes not even for the correct jurisdiction. Um, and then they may not have completed it correctly either. And then not only do you lose your protection, but you may also be lining yourself up for some other issues. So make sure, as I said, properly drafted, up to date, make sure it's got some clear forfeiture provisions so that you can get rid of a tenant if they start causing issues, which we will talk about more in the next webinar. Make sure you've thought about what you want to do about rent review, if there's a potential they're going to be in there for a long time. And make sure that you have really cleared off those repair obligations. And if there's anything quirky or different about the property or things that you're providing in with the tenancy, that you have ways of recouping that money. Now, I said I would come back to deposits. And I appreciate this is something of a whistle-stop tour through this at the moment. But most of you, I would hope by now, are aware um, that post um, 6th of April 2007, we had to start using tenancy deposit schemes. Now, initially, we had to um, secure the deposit in one of these schemes within 14 days. But at any time before trying to serve a Section 21 notice, we could then remedy us uh, landlords being able to forget to do that um, and, and then put themselves back into a position as if they complied. The courts and the government weren't happy uh, with the fact that landlords, some of them were not doing this until the point at which they came up to uh, wanting to get rid of the tenant. So what they did is they extended the time period to 30 days from the point at which you get payment. And that's key as well. A lot of people seem to think it's 30 days from the start date of the tenancy. It's not It's 30 days from the date at which that tenant actually pays the money over to you or your agent. So if they pay the deposit a couple of weeks before the tenancy starts, um, or even longer if they're, if they're securing the property for, for moving into in future, you need to make sure within 30 days that that payment has been secured in one of the tenancy deposit providers. And you've got a choice of three. You've got the deposit protection service, you've got my deposits, and you've got the tenancy deposit scheme all work slightly differently, but all on the same premise that you have your tenancy secured with them. They all run a dispute resolution scheme. So there's a dispute at the end of the tenancy about where the deposit should be distributed, that they will have a scheme and a method through which you can work. You also need to make sure once you've secured that deposit that you give prescribed information. And that prescribed information is in a set form, which will be provided to you by the scheme, depending on which scheme that you put the money into. And that basically includes uh, the deposit amount, um, how the deposit, the mechanism for returning it, how it will be returned to the tenant or to the landlord, how deductions will be made talks about those dispute resolution schemes and how to access them. And also it will tell the tenant what to do if, for example, uh, you're non-responsive as a landlord at the end of the tenancy. So you've got to make sure those two things are absolutely key in the diary. 30 days within payment of the deposit, it is protected and you've sent that key information out to the tenant. Why does that matter? Because if you get it wrong, not only do you have to repay the deposit to the tenant, leaving you without that protection, you can also be fined for up to three times that deposit value by way of damages being paid to the tenant. And if you think about that, OK, we are capped at five weeks rent, but say that you've got five weeks rent, you've got to pay your deposit back, that loses you that protection, and then you've got 15 weeks worth of rent then potentially that you're going to be fined um, and, and it is happening. And this is something that is going through the courts, unfortunately, on a very, very regular basis. The other thing as well is that you've got to pay the deposit back before you can serve a Section 21 notice to be able to remove the tenant from the property as well. So what this has led to is an emergence uh, more and more of, of low deposit or no deposit schemes. Um, and the reason that a lot of uh, landlords are, are going for lower deposit and then looking to recoup costs elsewhere, uh, generally through putting slightly higher rents, 
is because most of the deposit schemes run the dispute resolution are notoriously difficult to persuade them to find in favour of a landlord. Um, if you've got a court judgment against the tenant for rent arrears or disrepair, you will need to ask for it to be included in that judgment, a requirement that the deposit is paid out of the scheme in order to avoid you even having to argue under those circumstances that a deduction is appropriate. So I'm not saying that they never make deductions, but it is very difficult for a landlord to persuade a tenancy deposit scheme to actually pay out. So what a number of landlords have decided to do now is they've decided that rather than having a deposit, what they'll do is have a slightly higher rent. They then take that extra money that they've, they've got off the rent, put it into a, a fund. If there's a problem, they use it towards paying for whatever issues they find themselves in the end of the tenancy if they're unable to recover. If they recover from their tenants or don't have any problems with the tenants, then happy days, they've received slightly more rent and they can release that into their profits. Um, so that's why you're seeing a lot more of these no deposit schemes coming out. Um, and it is something that's worth thinking about because it does obviously take away that risk with you having to protect the deposits and so on. Start of tenancy requirements, conscious of time. So I'm motoring on here. So the other things that you need to be um, thinking about at the start of the tenancy are all these various documents and so on that you need to be providing to your tenant. So you need to give them a how to rent guide. Um, now, your how to rent guide, that's been a requirement since October 2015. It's a set copy that you can download off the Internet um, and you have to serve a hard copy unless you've got express consent by the tenant to serve it by email. So don't presume you can serve it by email. You absolutely have to serve it as hard copy unless you've got something in writing from them saying, yes, I'll have that how to rent guide by email. Um, why does it matter? It tells the tenant their rights, but more particularly, you can't serve a Section 21 notice if you haven't done that. And um, the other thing that you need to do is you obviously need to provide your gas safety certificate under Regulation 36 of the Gas Safety Installation and Use Regulations 1998. That needs to be uh, done annually and it needs to be served on the tenant within 28 days of that gas check being done. And that's a requirement for Section 21 to be served at the end of the tenancy too. Um, you also need to remember that if you've got a house in multiple occupation, you need to be sending a copy of that gas certificate into your local authority as well under your licensing requirements. The other things you need to look at is your smoke alarms. You've got to have one installed on every story of the property that is used wholly or partly as living accommodation, so one on every floor. You also need a carbon monoxide detector to be installed in any room in the accommodation which contains a solid fuel burning combustion appliance. So your boilers, your gas fires, your kitchen hob and so on will all need a carbon monoxide detector in the same room as them. It can mean on smaller flats, you can sometimes end up with a carbon monoxide detector in every single uh, area and hallway of the flat. But if that's what you need to comply with the um, regulations, that's what you've got to do. Um, Obviously, with HMOs, they will have requirements potentially for you to have more smoke detectors or more, co more carbon monoxide detectors, possibly one in each room. And that's something that is worth checking in those requirements. Um, if you don't comply with having the right um, smoke detectors and carbon monoxide detectors in the property, then the local authority can serve a notice on you. If you still don't put them in, they will come in and they will wire in. Uh, means wired smoke detectors and carbon monoxide detectors for you. They do not have to make good any damage they do when they do that wiring or redecoration and they can also charge you at a premium for having to come in and do that work. The other thing that you need to have is your energy performance certificate which most of you will be familiar with now. Um, minimum energy efficiency standards came in for um, any tenancy granted after the 1st of April 2018 has to be of a grade E or above. And then continuing on from April 2020 next year, that will apply to all residential property lettings in the UK. So if your property is below a band E, then you are going to have a problem in terms of your letting. 
for non-compliance with that, there are financial penalties and they go up the longer you're in breach. Um, there is an exemption register and there are various ways to have your property exempted. Um, that can include if it's a listed property, if there's problems with you being able to get permission to do it, or if there's problems with you being able to get access to do the works. If you need to know more about exemptions, then please do contact me and I can give you that information. Um, the other thing that you need to bear in mind is not only could you be fined, but you could also have a publication penalty. And again, this goes on a public register for a minimum of 12 months, requires local authority administration for your name ever to come off there. But that can obviously reduce the value for which you can rent your property because tenants will have access to that and potentially be able to look at it. Other tenancy requirements, your electrical safety certificate. Now, you don't have to have this uh, every year of the tenancy. If you've got a house in multiple occupation, it needs to be done every five years. However, what you have got is a requirement that you need to make sure the property is safe. Uh, part of that is making sure the electrical installations are safe. Um, you may also have a requirement under your insurance for the property to make sure that they've been checked regularly. And you also do have a requirement that you need to have any appliances that you're providing tested on a regular basis. So good practice is to make sure that you have a, a, an electrical certificate done on a regular basis. A number of landlords these days are having them done annually around about the same time as the gas safety certificate to cover themselves. Immigration status checks, which I mentioned earlier, that that's looking at your tenants and considering whether you've got enough information to be sure that they've got a right to be in the UK at the start of the tenancy. The obligation doesn't lapse. You need to make sure that you are checking throughout the tenancy that if they are uh, a party from another country who's perhaps here on a visa or similar, that that doesn't lapse during the time in which they are your tenants, so regular checks are needed. Now then, the, the um, default for, do, for not doing that, um, the fine is up to £3,000, which is not a small sum if they decide uh, that the local authority is going to go down the civil line. But um, one of the things that has been introduced from the 1st of December 2016 under the Immigration Act 2016 was criminal offences, so if you if you find out that you have got illegal immigrants and you fail to remove them or um, you're an agent who is in control of a property where there are illegal immigrants and you fail to take action on it, then what that's extended to is now you could be facing potential imprisonment of five years or a fine. So quite severe consequences there for getting this wrong. Tenant fee checks, uh, sorry, the tenant immigration checks are not something uh, that should be done as an afterthought. There's something that should be done as a priority and there's something that should be checked in on on a regular basis if you've got tenants that you might consider a potentially higher risk for their residency status or their permission to be in the UK uh, to have a potential to lapse at any time. You also need to consider if you are charging premiums for your uh, tenancies that you might have to pay SDLT or land transaction tax in Wales. Um, this is something that has caught some uh, landlords out because they've thought, well, we're not charging deposits anymore. We're not charging as many fees up front. So what we're going to do is charge them a premium and then a rent. Um, and then what they've done is they've forgotten to pay SDLT, certainly on some of the central London properties. And then they've got HMRC coming after them for unpaid tax, which is not what you need. The other thing that's being cracked down on at the moment is mortgage default. Now, what this is, is where you've got a buy to let mortgage on your property. Uh, you will probably have permission to sublet, but not everybody has got a buy to let mortgage. And it's understandable because they tend to have higher interest rates. So repayments are higher. Um, where that is the case, there is probably going to be a provision within the mortgage that says that you need to have permission before you sublet your property. If you haven't got permission and the bank becomes alerted to this, then there are chances that it could cause issues with your default of your mortgage, which could have knock on effects. Uh, again, this is not something that most agents will take responsibility for, as it's your responsibility as a landlord to make sure that you have the necessary permissions before you let the property. 
Um, finally, last point to make on this slide is landlords insurance. Now, I'm frequently coming across landlords these days who do not have insurance. Um, it used to be far more popular. I'm not sure uh, why it's, uh, it's less popular these days, but it does seem that people are feeling like this isn't an expense they want to take on. The thing is, though, is if you have got a tenant and even some of the best reference tenants can cause problems, tenants generally don't have that many assets. Um, they don't have a property uh, necessarily that they own freehold for you to get a charge over because they are renting. Uh, they may not have a huge amount of possessions that are particularly valuable and they may not have income that is substantial or any substantive savings. This means if something goes wrong, you can't necessarily get the money back from them. Um, even if you can recover from them, you often find that you are paying up front uh, to deal with things like legal fees and keeping your mortgage repayments going whilst you try to uh, follow up that recovery or indeed to remove them from the property. This is where landlord's insurance really steps into its own because it covers you in that situation to make sure that you are not going to be left behind. So I mentioned then that I was going to come on lastly to having a look quickly at some of these um, obligations that are implied for landlords. Um, now, I've taken you back here to Section 11 of the Landlord and Tenant Act 1985. It is something that does get forgotten about um, and, and can still catch people off guard. And it is um, what a lot of agents I know refer to as the taps and toilets clause. But essentially what this is, is it's a requirement that's implied into any tenancy that's less than seven years long for residential property that you've got to keep the property in a certain level of repair. So that means that you have to repair the structure and exterior of the dwelling house. You need to make sure that all the installations of the house for the supply of water, gas, electricity and for sanitation, uh, so all your drainage and so on, uh, are, are in good working order. And you need to repair and keep in proper working order all the installations in the house for space heating and hot water. Um, so that's your boilers. Um, and again, most landlords should have a boiler service done at least once a year as part of that gas safety hygiene that they do on the property. Now, these are implied into every tenancy, regardless of whether they're set out in your tenancy agreement or not. Um, and you can be uh, given either an order for specific performance by the court or or and. Uh, order to pay damages if you fall foul of any of these basic repairs. The thing that's happened though is that in recent years that very basic level of repair is no longer being felt to be sufficient. Um, so it was 1985 that that came out. It's been in there for a while but again the courts were feeling that there were still some things coming through that weren't acceptable. So what they've done is they've introduced the Homes Fitness for Human Habitation Act 2018. Um, and what that says is, again, it's implied from the 20th of March 2019, so it's in force now, where a tenancy is less than seven years long. So any new tenancy that's coming in after the 20th of March, or indeed, bearing in mind if you renew a tenancy, or a tenancy ends its fixed term and carries over, those will count as new tenancies that will be caught by this legislation as well. So it needs to be fit for human habitation at the time the tenancy is granted or created, um, and it will remain fit for human habitation during the term of the tenancy. So you've got to keep it um, up to a certain level. Now, there are some exceptions um, to, what, to what might be covered and what you might be required to do as a landlord. So if it's a problem that's been caused by a tenant, or um, if it's something that the, um, that the tenant has done to cause the issue that it should be dealing with under the repair covenants, you're not obliged to then have to deal with that. It's caused by an act of God, flood, fire, et cetera. That's something that you would expect to be covered by insurance. Again, that's not then considered to be breaching this particular act. Um, if you can't get consent to do the works from third parties, so you can't get planning consent, consent from a superior freeholder perhaps, consent from your mortgage lender or consent from the neighbours to do the works, that can be uh, an exception to you uh, having the penalties under this Act. Um, or or you, you are exempt from it as well where the tenant's not an individual, so say you're letting to a company 
under a contractual tenancy that we mentioned earlier, then you're exempt then. So when's it unfit for human habitation? Well, again, this is not an exhaustive list, um, but it's basically looking at things like significant disrepair, issues with stability, issues with damp, uh, internal arrangement. If it's not, if there's something that's been done in the way uh, in which the rooms have been structured that is causing a health hazard, lack of natural light, lack of ventilation, inadequate water supply, lack of proper drainage and toilet facilities, uh, lack of proper facilities for preparation of food, or any of the prescribed ha uh, hazards that are found under Section 2 of the Housing Act 2004. And they are basically anything that causes a risk of harm to health, including mental health um, or safety of the occupiers. So that's damp and mould, excess cold and heat, asbestos, carbon monoxide, lead and radiation, uh, overcrowding, lighting, noise, things that are causing regular trips and falls, uh, poisonous substances, and so on and so forth. It's quite a long list. Uh, but it's basically anything, if you think of it, that's going to cause a risk of harm to health or mental health is likely to be somewhere on that list. And they have started a review in February 2019. A review was commissioned into that hazards list. So I suspect you will find that it is actually going to be changing relatively soon and probably expanding even further. So there's quite a lot there that suddenly becomes the responsibility of the landlord. Um, what they can do if you haven't uh, complied with that is they can make you pay compensation to the tenant. They can make you do the necessary works to improve the property. You can have local authority enforcement actions. So there may be notices that carry penalties attached to them of fines and so on as well. Um, and of course, if you've got one of those notices from the local authority, it is going to frustrate your ability to then serve a Section 21 notice. So again, with this increased pressure on how much works might be covered under that Fitness for Human Habitation Act, again, this is why a number of landlords are looking at um, raising the rent and then putting it into a fund. Because again, these are not things that you'll be able to take out of a deposit, but they are things that if you've got that extra bit coming in that you've put into a fund at the side, then you could cover there. Um, so that today was a whistle stop tour uh, through some of the key issues that you need to think of at the start of a tenancy. Um, as I said, it's by no means exhaustive, and I am very conscious that I have gone through that at a very quick pace. So what I have left up on the screen there is my contact details. If you need any more information about any of the points I have mentioned, or there's anything else you're concerned about, uh, about what you should be doing as a landlord, or if you think you've got yourself into perhaps a bit of trouble by not quite getting one of these things right, then please do feel that you can pick up the phone to me or drop me an email. And thank you very much for listening.